episode 264 of the TV Dudes, recorded December 11th, 2019. Toy Box. Let's uh, let's talk about toys. Let's talk about uh, playing around in the toy box. Let's uh, all kinds of stuff in the toy box, really. Yeah, yeah we got we got toys in there. We got movies in there. We got uh, stuff made from uh, movies that were made into toys. We got uh, comic books that were that were made into that shows. Were made into shows and possibly novels are made into comic books. I'm not really sure. The comic books that are made into movies that are made into people, and there are people that are made into toys. It's it's a whole it's a whole thing. Yeah, it's this whole big thing. Dogs and cats living together. <laughs> so uh, we are going to be talking about uh, the toys that made us, which has just hit season three on Netflix. It's spinoff series, The Movies That Made Us. In season one on Netflix. Uh, we're going to talk about V-Wars in season one on Netflix. As well as The Mandalorian, which, as I understand it, is on season one? Is on season on one. On Disney+. Plus. It's actually season 12 of Star Wars, though. Got it, got yeah. it. But that's The whole Star Wars thing is wrapping up here in a minute. I mean, oh, they're, yeah, They're yeah. doing the, good good job, Star Wars. It's been a great run, wrapping yeah. up the Skywalker thing. Well, you know, I mean. Sailing off into the sunset. Yeah, Disney's, Disney's pretty good at just kind of wrapping things up, saying, you know what? That's it's enough clean, of that. It's over. We don't need. We don't need that money. Yeah, we I have think plenty it's of time money. Time to reboot New Hope. <laughs> Hear me out. The newest hope. <laughs> New Hope two. Hope newer. Look, they're going to redo the prequels before they do that. They're going to start at one, and uh, we're going to get a hip, edgy new Jar Jar. Oh my sweet Naboo. <laughs> uh, and before we get to all that, we're the TV dudes. I'm Randy. I'm Les. Just the two of us this time. Kyle is down with a, a stomach bug. You know, I, I the just the two of us theme is great because I just realized that this week we are 20 years into the millennium. Yeah, we are. Yeah. And so, yeah, just the two of <laughs> us. Uh, it, it does seem like the millennium has had a lot less Will Smith than I expected it to. It really has, which is a positive, I think. I mean, like, it, yeah, it, you know, I'm, I'm impressed with the guy. He kind of backed out of it, yeah. let the millennium roll off on its own. Although there were two Will Smiths this year in Gemini Man. I haven't seen that yet. No, me neither. If we had a movie podcast, we could probably talk about it. That's true. But, but we since don't. Since we don't. We have a TV podcast where we're going to talk about movies. The most we can do is talk about shows on TV about movies. Uh, Yes. Yeah. We're going to slowly segue into it. Mm. All right. So let's start off by talking about toys that made us, movies that made us, and... Before we do that, you had a you, you had an interview with the guy who runs this. I did uh, Brian Volkweiss, who uh, started a little company called Comedy Dynamics and has directed nearly every stand up special that you've seen in the last ten years. That's mm-hmm. won any kind of Grammys. Kevin Hart, Louis C.K. Uh, if you've seen a, a big stand up special in the last few years, Dave Chappelle, he's probably the guy that directed it. Yeah. So, uh, which we talk about in the interview as being kind of a special kind of directing. You're not making your movie. You're not an auteur. You are there to facilitate the filming of a stand-up comedy special, which is someone else's material and someone else's tone, and they don't really want to or need to know how movies work. And there's a great blind item there where he talks about someone who is a great director who kind of fucked up a special. Yeah, <laughs> in his opinion. God, I want to know who it is. <laughs> it's uh, you can you can math it out. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm not gonna we're not gonna go into no. it here. You could you can work it have, out. Have fun with that. But it was it was a fun discussion. And then you talked to him about how the production is on toys that made us and movies that made us. Yeah. It's a great interview and it, it Yeah, it's super neat. They he talks about how they get to choose these things and and trying to find the sweet spot between obscurity and and everybody already knowing all the stories. And I think that's kind of what they did really well. Toys they made us this season, the My Little Pony stuff and the Sanrio stuff. Yeah. I just didn't know any of that. And yeah. it's, it's super interesting. I like the way they do it. Moving into movies that made us, though. Yeah. This was what really surprised me. Their first season, they pick, uh, is it Die Hard? Die Hard and Home Ghostbusters Alone seemed and obvious. Ghostbusters, yeah. Then Home Alone. And Ghostbusters seemed obvious. Dirty Dancing, Dirty is, Dancing. The, is the dark horse, interesting, really blew me away. And it's the one that I think both of us watched. I watched it first. Yes, I watched it first. And... I like you. I was shocked. I didn't think I liked Dirty Dancing. I had the I had the, the soundtrack on cassette. I I watched it a few times. But this was the episode that made me realize why this series works and why it's a spinoff. I mean, why why the Toys series worked and why it could get a spinoff. It's because it didn't matter that 
I didn't love Dirty Dancing the way that my girlfriend loves Dirty Dancing. Right. Like, it, I, I like it. And like I said, I, I really love the soundtrack. I sure. think everybody Guilty Pleasure did. Uh, and just own your Guilty Pleasures. Rock that shit out <laughs> of the stoplight. But, you know, it wasn't my movie. That said, I discovered watching this episode that I just love the stories behind these things. Yeah. Uh, I sh- we should do a podcast about, <laughs> you know, entertainment. So I... I I fell in love with the weird little stories and finding out that Patrick Swayze was how he was and, you know, Jennifer Grey. The the, the relationship between the two of them and that, like, that they met on Red Dawn and they didn't like each other. But and they have chemistry just, I mean, yeah. ra- radiating off of them. That wanting to murder each other and wanting to fuck each other is very close. Yes. If you've ever wondered <laughs> what the blur of that line looks like on screen, you can watch the screen test. And yes. It's astonishing. Yeah. It's really good. That said... I would have loved to have seen what the Billy Zane, Jen- Sarah Jessica Parker version looked oh, like. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, I could totally have seen that. And similarly, in Ghostbusters, I would have loved to have seen what uh, John Belushi and, and Eddie, Murphy. Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd might have yeah. been like. Well, Eddie Murphy, they talk about Dan Aykroyd's script and how basically slime or uh, Stay Puft is the only thing that's in it from that script. Yeah. Like, they lost most of that script. Everything I'd ever heard about Ghostbusters was that Dan Aykroyd will – put in a 30 minute exposition scene explaining to the audience exactly how the physics of a ghost trap works. Yeah. Like everything could be actually gamed out and, and he knew to a maddening degree. Do you think that the, if you take an empty bottle of uh, crystal skull vodka that you can trap a ghost in there? <laughs> I, I bet that thing's a ghost trap. Probably. But I, uh, I love that the notion of like Winston Zeddemore was a completely different character. Yeah. And they brought in Ernie Hudson. And he thought he was playing this character. And all of a sudden he's like second banana. And right. he's he's cool about it. He's like, hey, look, it's, it happens. I mean, at the start of it, he's coming in at page 27. And <clears throat> yeah. I was like, yeah, Winston does come in really late. No, that's the yeah, early originally. version of him coming in. He yeah. ends up coming in on like page 63 or yeah. 68. They gave, they gave half his dialogue and half his character to Venkman. Yeah. Which, of course, you do. You get you're getting Bill Murray. Murray. That's great. But it, it is really weird. And... And the reason I think Ernie Hudson probably is an absolute saint for not being more legitimately mad about this right now. I mean, you got to let it go, I'm sure, over time. But yeah. they continued to shortchange Zed more. Uh, like, they continued to shortchange Winston oh, yeah. on toys, on yep. everything over the years. Yeah. They are, they're also in the through line of this. You, you look at the next one, you look at Die Hard and you look at Home Alone. Um, Home Alone probably has the least, it had the the success where they were like, they were not expecting it to do that well. Mm-hmm. They're like, no, well, this is an 80s action movie. Like, this is about a kid. Like, no one's going to buy this. And it instead, it, like, sweeps the box office for yeah. weeks and owns like Christmas. Like, 80-something weeks. Yeah. And it's crazy. It, there was – I don't think there was – there were. I don't remember any stories of that of, like, oh, it almost fell apart. Like, there's a story where they almost didn't have Daniel Stern as the other wet bandit. Yeah. Yeah, where they um, even shot some stuff. I mean, it's like yeah. the Eric Stoltz, uh, Marty McFly. Like, yeah. they, they even shot stuff and they were just like – uh, it's not Pesci working. Didn't, I think Pesci didn't click with him. Yeah. But in general, Home Alone feels like, of, of all of these, the one they're like, oh, well, this this kind of came together. Yeah. It's just nobody expected to be the big hit it was. Die Hard feels like, oh, this could have been, this could have gone so wrong. Nobody thought Bruce Willis could work as an action hero. Yeah. They took him off the poster because yeah. everybody's laughing at it. And, and not in the way they meant for it to. <laughs> and and then they you know, they talk about, well, they cast a ballet dancer as their big bad, as their big bad terrorist. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like there's, they were writing the script as they went on like their second or third screenwriter, and it's it's just nuts. It's everything you ever hear about. Oh well, that like when you read these things in the trades or or Deadline reports on it or whatever. Well, oh that they're doing reshoots again. That probably means this movie's gonna suck. From what I can tell from watching these, all of our favorite classic movies were absolutely written like coked up and drunk on the fly. Yeah, the takeaway is definitely almost every great movie almost didn't make it. Yes. And that the line between success and failure is so razor thin, no wonder movie executives are so stressed all the time. Yeah, because so much of this stuff is just dumb luck with egos and yeah. people showing up when they ought to. Yeah, and... Bill Murray, they weren't sure Bill Murray was going to show up for filming. Yeah. He was not in that he Paris. Was being a, uh, not, you know, they don't make him out to be a dick about it or anything, but like everybody was going off Aykroyd's word on it. Yeah. And he just like, is, is Bill going to be here? Oh yeah. Sure, he'll be here. Yeah. Are it's... ghosts real? Yes. Oh, well this is oh, really reassuring. This is great. Yeah. Yeah. It, so it's a really fun series. I I love it because it really doesn't matter if it's your toy or your movie. I yeah. mean, obviously they're going to cover something where you're like, oh, I had those. Yeah, I want to watch it. But I would encourage you to crapshoot watch whatever the next one up is because I was really surprised at some of these weird ass stories. Yeah, I went into this for Die Hard and I loved the Dirty Dancing episode. Yeah. And similarly with the toys, like I went in for GI Joe and Transformers, which I love, and those are great episodes. Don't get me wrong, but. 
the My Little Pony and the Hello Kitty stuff is fascinating. to Disney Plus. Yeah. I went in for the 60s Kurt Russell movies and uh, <laughs> and then grudgingly forced myself to watch uh, The Mandalorian for this episode. You were dragged kicking and screaming into The Mandalorian. Really was. Yeah. Really was. Uh, you know, you could take me into The Mandalorian warm <laughs> or you could take me into The Mandalorian cold. Uh, but as it turned out, and I love The Mandalorian. Like I... along with Watchmen, it is my it is like my go-to every week. You did not love it as much as I did, but... So I... I can fairly say I loved The Mandalorian. Really? Uh, that that I liked it at all. Yeah. I, I know really means that like- we, On a curve? We, we cleared this, yeah, on a curve. <laughs> it does not touch Watchmen quite for me or, oh, or something sure. like that for me. But it's exceptionally well done that it overcomes so much of what I think is just dumb about Star Wars. Yeah. Star Wars is just not my property. And, and if you're- Everybody's experienced it. I mean, if you're yeah. if you're not of one fandom and somebody really starts to geek out about it, there's a point where you're like, you know, this kind of seems dumb, and you don't want to apply that vision to your fandom, right? Because that'll sting, right? But but for me, there's just a lot about Star Wars that I'm like, Meh. yeah. But this works if you're not a Star Wars fan. This, this works on just, a level of a space western. Yeah, this is just Lone Wolf and Cub or yeah. whatever. Like I love it. This is great. This and they is are space western samurai. They are unapologetically riffing on Lone Wolf and Cub and Do it. Man with No Name and the the shootout with him and IG Eleven is straight up like a them raiding the raiding the, the village and, and uh, the good Pablo bad Pablo Pascal is that Pedro Pascal. Pedro Pascal. He does a spectacular job of acting through that armor. Yeah. I noticed that uh, as the series goes on, he ditched the gloves more and more, yeah. uh, which was great. That was the part that was making it look goofy of like, there there were some points in the first couple episodes of like, you're having trouble moving in your armor there, Mando. Yeah. Uh, I I like that they've improved his armor. I love that everybody wants to steal it from him. Yeah. Uh, and everybody's scared too. Yeah. it's It's been good. Um, some of the cameos have not worked as well for me, but overall I find people blending in. Uh, fucking Pillboy. Yeah. From Good Place. Yeah. I, I had no sooner, when we were talking the other day, and I, I was complaining about the cameos and how they just shouldn't drop people in, and then they dropped in Pillboy, and it worked. And he's great. And I, I swear I watched that episode, <clears throat> and I'm like, is that Eugene Cordero? I think it's Eugene. And I looked at IMDb, and they had not updated it yet, and I'm like, no, it's got to be somebody else. Then I go look up him, his credits, and it's on there. I'm like, it is him. Sidaris did pretty well. I, I liked her. Loved. Is yeah. it Gina Carrero? Is Gina, name? Gina Carano. Oh man, Gina she, Carano's great. Now, and, and it took me a minute to figure out why I knew she's from Deadpool. Yeah, um, she's great, man. Yeah. I loved their whole thing. And whoever the fuck cut together the Mando intro to Perfect Strangers is a genius. Oh, yes, I would watch that show. Also, Baby Yoda. I love Baby Yoda. Baby Yoda could be too cloying, or could be. There's a line between making baby Ewoks, which are cute and adorable and fun, and Jar Jar, who's fucking annoying. And it could have been easy for Baby Yoda to be a Jar Jar. Yeah, and and I don't know. They might still tip that line for me. I could see that being a gray area where some yeah. of us fall and some of us don't. Yeah. Uh, but right now, Baby Yoda's working for me. I am not I'm not on a, like, let's fill my Facebook timeline with Baby Yoda memes level of love <laughs> for it. But I get it. Yeah. It's super cute. Uh, I'm still astonished that Favreau flexed any level of muscle to get no toys made for Christmas? That is this? crazy. The, the the rumor I heard, and it seems to back up with the fact that they didn't have any Baby Yoda stuff ready, is that- Are we attributing like a, a huge third world country strike? <laughs> Maybe to, so. To the, Favreau. The, the, they were They were like, they saw Baby Yoda. They're like, we need to get working on toys and all this stuff. And he's like, no, if you have toys and stuff ready in the pipeline, that's where leaks happen. And not people the toys are, you're looking for. And, and somehow- it didn't happen. Like the toys didn't start production until after the show had come out, which is crazy because it means there's not a ton of merchandise for, for Christmas. I haven't Googled it, but I will have to now. I'm sure that there are a whole lot of really great knockoff, illegal, oh, yeah. uh, baby alien green lump. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a lot of Baby Yoda t-shirts on on those sites because those things turn, the, turn them oh, around yeah. in a minute. But uh, the official plush and pop aren't supposed to hit till next year, I don't think. 
Well, people yeah. will still be into it. Oh, sure. And, you know, that baby's like 50, so he'll still look like a baby then. It's, yeah, he'll know. be 55. Yeah. I don't know how that works, but somehow, space space years. Space years. But Favreau is, is, I think, a big part of why this works, even though he has not directed any of the episodes himself. I'm really surprised. Uh, he created it, but I was really surprised that he didn't even direct the – that yeah. I assumed he directed the pilot. Yeah, he didn't direct the pilot at all. And – He's also got Dave Filoni, who is like the guru of Star Wars, uh, who ran Clone Wars and Rebels and definitely knows Star Wars on a level that very few people do and who gets what works about it. Because Lucas knows Star Wars a lot. He just doesn't understand why it's good. Yeah. Uh, whereas Dave Filoni knows what's good and what's I feel, bad. I feel and like there's a, there's a comparison to be made between Lucas and Aykroyd on Ghostbusters. Yeah. Like, Aykroyd knows how everything in Ghostbusters works, but you can't let Dan tell the story. No, it'll be really bad if you let Dan no tell the story. No one will want to sit through the Federation trade agreement. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the negotiation with permit boards uh, yeah. that is of New York for Ghostbusters. Yeah, for sure. But I um I think this is really good. I love the the use of Western tropes. I love that it looks like Star Wars, like it looks a little dirty and dingy. And Yeah, it doesn't have the slick flight of the Navigator ships that they had in the prequels. And it's small cast. Mm -hmm. Like like if you look at it every episode, there's like five people in the credits. And yeah. it's And it's, so they make it – they don't make it feel small, which with, we talked about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and how they made it feel small because it was on TV. But yeah. it – it feels big. It feels like Star Wars. It feels a little. It feels more like Firefly. I feel like yeah. they are lost at the edge of a very large universe. Yeah, and I love that. Whereas Shield felt like they were on a plane on a very small planet. Yes. Yeah. For sure. I, uh, the best thing about this show for me is the faux Ralph McQuarrie art at the end. It's really good, uh, which is spectacular. And I wish they had an opening credits of it. I also like their music. Yeah. Uh, like so they... their music is Ludwig. Uh, I'm blanking on his name. Gordon. So he is the music collaborator that works with Donald Glover. So he's responsible for a lot of the music of like Redbone. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. I mean, he's done a lot. A that makes lot sense. of stuff. Because I didn't recognize the name. And I assume it was like Giacchino or something. Mm -hmm. But no, it's got it's got a Star Wars sound, but it's got its very own distinctive sound too. And I love the little the little uh the Mandalorian like theme that he's got going. Yeah, it's really good. Um the incidental music is good. Like when you're doing Star Wars music, you're up against like John Williams and Michael Giacchino. Like you are you are up mm -hmm. against the best. And to create a sound that feels of a piece but completely its own. But its own show. That's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think that that the production design, like it is a Disney Plus, they were they were like, this has to work, and they definitely put the work into it. For me, where where it stands right now, um I need to know what's happening beyond just trying to keep this kid safe week to week until he becomes an adult, which seems right. to be the plan right now, unless it, I've missed something. It is fairly episodic. Like, like I the, don't know where we're taking but yeah. but it's not it, the first few episodes were were episodic in that he had steps to take to go get the bounty. Yeah. And then he had steps to take to resolve his issues with how he left the bounty. Yeah. And now we are starting to get into an open-ended, uh, what are we doing week to week except trying to find more and more remote places? Yeah. There's... And I don't want to just be hunted. I, I want to know where we're running to. I think there's got to be a point a point at which we find out exactly what the Empire wanted, this, this fallen Empire wanted with Yoda. Like, yes. are they trying to remanufacture a big Jedi two to use by the two weapon? hands of blue? Like, it's there's something there's something big there that's got to be the, the payoff to this, yes. this season. Yes. Uh, because, yeah, you're right. It feels small. And for the most part, I'm okay with that and I like it, but you can't maintain it forever. Yeah. And I feel like we've got to, <clears throat> I'm trusting in John from Bro that, that he knows storytelling well enough that that if I could feel this break point coming, that they're actually going to deliver it for me. I think so. Yeah. I, I don't see this meandering off into nothingness. Hopefully. But yeah, it, it's – I think it's really good. I, I definitely see why Disney thought they could hang a network off of it. And I definitely have friends who don't watch a lot of TV who are watching this and Watchmen. Ah. I, like I said, don't care about Star Wars, didn't want to watch this, watched uh, hours of stuff on Disney Plus before <laughs> wading into this. And it's it's just a really good show. Yeah. I mean it's a fun – if you if you like an action-y Western with some space stuff thrown in, it doesn't matter that it's Star Wars. <laughs> really good show. Also – Completely helmeted main character. Yeah. I want a dread show now. Yeah. Now. They're still developing that, right? Aren't they? Isn't that going to happen? Hopefully. Here's your proof of concept. You, God, you, I, can, I want... you can take anybody. I, you Have Carl Urban just do it as a voiceover the way that uh, <laughs> the way that Matt uh, – oh, shit. The guy from White Collar. 
Matt he, Bomer? Yeah, Matt Bomer is in Doom Patrol, technically. But right. he is not the physical body. Oh, is he not? He's just voicing he that He just dude? voices that. Oh, I thought that and, was still uh, Matt like Bomer. Brendan Fraser isn't in like the Robot Man suit. He's just voicing that, I think. Are you sure? No, yeah. I think that's Brendan Fraser. Is he actually I'm in that pretty suit? sure that's Brendan. Oh, okay. He's got that clunky body. That's, well, that's definitely Brendan Fraser. Uh, yeah, Matt Bomer is uh, it's a different actor oh, who's, who's down as Larry. I did not know that. And so, yeah, you could totally just, you know, just, just do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Carl Urban will do it. He loves oh, it. He loves that character. Yeah. So, so here we go. Helmet, helmet me up a guy in a universe I like more than this, and let's go. Uh, all right, so let's let's talk about V Wars. This is so, as as far as I know, this was a this was a comic book property. Yes, and I got to interview uh, Adrian Holmes, who played uh, the coolest guy in Letterkenny, Bradley, uh, and he and uh, Boone from Lost, uh, Ian Summerholder. Yeah. So first things first, were you aware that Ian Summerholder has aged into Rob Lowe? Uh, yes, that makes sense to me. That it, tracks. The, whatever natural yeah. Luke Wilson head widening that occurs for all men at, at, in their 30s and yeah, 40s yeah. Uh, has squared his skull off and now he just looks like Rob Lowe, which is great. I mean, it's yeah. just great for him. Uh, before he was just giant eyes and cheekbones and yeah. now, now it's very Rob Lowe-ish. Um, <laughs> V-Wars is a bit trashy and silly, but high-minded enough in what it's doing with vampirism that... I it's weirdly fun. Interesting. Uh, so the basic setup is this. Uh, Ian Summerholder is like all doctors on television and a phenomenally attractive scientist. Sure. And uh, he is talking at the start about how climate change is going to melt ice that is going to have some like pre-biblical plagues. Like we're about to have super bugs that, that we don't have antibodies for. Right. Okay. This is this is a real problem. Like yes. this isn't this is not a V Wars problem. Right. This is a real problem. Yes. This is how we get like some fucked up super flu that yeah. killed off. I'd I'd rather have vampires. To yes. Be honest. So uh, he's at the start of the first episode. I think he's like about to go off on his dinner for his anniversary or something, and they he gets word that they've lost contact with uh, near Arctic uh, research station. Okay. When they get up there. It's one of the most satisfying scientific scenes I think I've ever seen in a show. They walk into a place and they find a couple of corpses and his buddy with him, Adrian Holmes, is like, Mm -hmm. well, we got to get out of here. And he goes, no, no, we have to call this in and stay. Yeah. Because we're exposed to whatever this is. Yeah. And I I wanted to stand up and applaud (laughs) of like, oh, my God, thank you for realizing that like he shines his flashlight up in the air and you can see particulates. And he's like, no, buddy. We're fucked. Yeah. <laughs> this is happening now. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, what they've got is, we know, obviously going to be vampirism. Yeah. But they both get sick, and it's like, a, it's like a really bad cold, and they keep them in quarantine for like a week, and they both kind of recover from their cold and seem okay, mm-hmm. but they've recovered differently. Okay. So Ian Summerholder, like some of humanity just gets a cold. Yeah. Some of humanity gets a cold and turns into a vampire. That's just a bad luck. But they can walk around in sun and stuff. I mean, it's not they're not uh, they're not vampires as we they, would. They blood drinking vampires. They, they, yeah, basically, you you just turn into a creature that uh, occasionally, when you get hungry, your senses go off the charts, and you can see all the veins in somebody's body, and then your teeth come out in a way that would put Buffy's vamps to shame. Like they are vicious, thirty days a night, fucked up looking vampires. Okay, all right, but. Uh, you don't really want to do it. Like it is a, you didn't mean to get this disease. So they're not monsters. They're more like, it's more like vampire version of zombies. A little bit. Only it, it, it doesn't happen consistently. Like these are people who are basically going about their lives. It makes it really hard to detect the disease. Okay. Uh, but when the hunger hits them, there's, they, they're going to black out and tear a body to shreds. Okay. So this is called V Wars. What makes it wars? Uh, Summerholder, being the scientist who just got a cold and got over it, he now wants to figure out, like, well, well what is it exactly? 
Uh, and in the meantime, he's starting to notice that there's a lot of murders happening. And uh, his best friend is clearly tied to it. Okay. And so basically his best friend has become patient zero for a huge vampirism outbreak. Okay. And it spreads really easily. Okay, so this is less of war than more of like a outbreak disease type yeah, thing. Yeah, only okay. uh, it very quickly, within two or three episodes, it, it starts to become a huge group of people who occasionally get hungry, flip out, and eat something full of blood. Yeah. They didn't ask to get this disease. They didn't even know they got exposed. Yeah. This just started happening to them. But they're monsters now, and the solution can't be to stake them. Hmm. And so if, you know, we've, we've seen stuff where people are like, no, we got to cure these zombies. These mindless creatures are our families and stuff. But the zombies can't really stand up for themselves. Yeah. These are a whole lot of people who are like, fuck you. This is just how I am now, and yeah. it's not my fault. Yeah. And you can't vilify me. Huh. Uh, Interesting. And so it... it I, I, I think we're heading to a tipping point where enough people have committed horrible, grisly murders they did not mean to do mm -hmm. that there's going to have to be a discussion about do we wholesale forgive this? Yeah. Like, none of us meant to do this, but half the city killed people. Yeah. Uh, and it's – that to me is the interesting hook of this show. Uh, getting to watch Adrian Holmes uh, – both be horrified by what's happening to him, but you can't stop it. And it's kind of awesome. Hmm. Like, uh, having your physical and, and eyesight and everything. I mean, he can read menus from like a half mile and <laughs> yeah. Okay. All uh, right. But at the same time, like he also can't, he just, he just wakes up having killed somebody hmm. and, and calls his best friend and is like, Oh my God, what did I do? Huh, interesting. It's uh it's it's pretty interesting. You can watch, I mean it's Netflix. You can go binge all of it right now. It uh it really does sit a weird line between um something I would expect to be 22 episodes on Fox. Yeah, yeah. And uh and a a vicious uh eight episode daybreak kind of thing or 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 you know, huh. like it 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 sits some weird line between there. It's a little sillier than I thought it would be from Netflix. But it's also a little more like the strain than I expected. Interesting. Uh, shit happens on it, so it's it's faster not the strain. Than the strain yeah. But uh, <laughs> but in terms of like the actual vampirism is not sexy. Like huh, okay. they they they're just still people walking around, and Adrian Holmes is a cool dude, and you know him having super strength and stuff is kind of has some uh, Brundle fly breaking arms in the sure. contest kind of kind of moments. But when he actually tooths out and and is a he's a fucking monster, hmm. and it's not velvet cloak, wine glass sexy, like it's definitely not Anne Rice vampires. Interesting. Okay. I'd I'd recommend giving uh, at least a couple episodes to it, especially if you. I mean, a lot of people like these shows. If if you've ever liked something like Winona Earp or Grimm or uh, maybe a little bit of Lucifer, it sounds like in that vein. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. would put it in, in, that, in vein. that tone. Yeah, <laughs> I see what you did accidental. There. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's V-Wars. I'd, I'd give it a look. It's fun. All right. Um, so, as always, if you want to support us, you can go over to patreon.com slash TV Dudes and throw us a buck an episode, which helps us keep all these streaming services going so we can keep watching all these various shows for you and cover stuff. And uh, we're going to be back next week with some other stuff. And until that time, TV Dudes out. The TV Dudes is an independently run podcast and a member of the Electric Sweater Podcast Network. We are exclusively listener supported. If you'd like to help us out, go to patreon.com slash TV Dudes. You can like us on Facebook and Twitter at TV Dudes. All the music for our show is by our friend and original TV dude, Gregory J. Amani Smith. To find out more about us, go to the TV Dudes.com and electricsweater.com. I'm Grant Davis. Thanks for listening.